Hello and welcome to this CityWire and Mercer virtual event, Metamorphosis, Wealth Management Strategies in Transformation. I'm Natalie Breen from CityWire in London, and I'll be hosting the first of these three sessions alongside my colleagues Catherine Schindler and Frank Talbot. First up, a few points about the event overall. This session is 40 minutes long, and there'll be time for Q&A at the end, so please do submit your questions using the tool to the right of this screen. In this session, we will discuss portfolio construction. As the pressure to generate returns continues to weigh on investors, we will explore the routes to achieving performing portfolios from diversification, alternatives, and of course, sustainability. To help me dissect these themes, I'm joined from New York by Nalo Sullivan, the CIO for Mercer and EMEA and Asia, Samantha Davidson, the US Investment Solutions Segment Leader for Mercer, and we have Bradley Kellum, part of the Wealth and Asset Management and Retail and Business Banking Division from Oliver Wyman. Thank you all so much for joining me here today. Let's open up broadly. Can you give us an overview of how you see the landscape for investors at the moment? Niall, let me come to you first. As CIO, can you paint the landscape for us? Yeah, well, it's certainly a, an interesting time at the moment. I, I'm reminded of the, the quote that I think was from Lenin, that's Vladimir, not John, by the way, uh, when he talked about for periods that there was um, decades where nothing happens and then weeks where decade happens. And it feels like that's what's going on at the moment. We've talked about the potential for regime change in the market for years, but it is happening now. For the last 10 years, there was really major macro forces that were driving markets. You had the interest rate moves by the central banks that were looking to support the economy. That led to liquidity. And so you had a really interesting situation where equities, and particularly developed market growth type stocks, had a really good run. You had government bonds doing very well. But on top of that, even though both were going up, they tended to be very good correlating with each other. In other words, when equities zigged, bonds tended to zag. You put the two together and you got a really smooth upward return. And so there wasn't really much point in having diversification inside portfolios beyond developed market equities and government bonds. But as you talked about, Natalie, this is the period of metamorphosis. It is changing now. And to be clear, I don't think that absent some shock that we haven't thought about that the world is going to experience some recession or a failure of GDP growth. Consumer and balance sheets are still strong. The stock of liquidity is still there. And there's a lot of infrastructure spend that will have to be done over the next while, potentially creating a period like there was post-war um, with infrastructure spend supporting the economy. Inflation is a fear and it is likely to be permanently higher, but probably not likely to get massively out of control over the next while. But I think what is going on is actual regime change. So what you're seeing now is your 10-year Treasury yield is now rising up to about 2%. In the last year, or in this year, sorry, value has beaten growth by about 10%. And the last year, if you were to look at the relative performance between, say, US stocks and Chinese stocks, there was a 40% differential. So a lot of things that we said would matter in side portfolios and the need for diversification is becoming real today. So, Samantha, as, as we come to terms with some of these massive global shifts, the digging and the zagging, and not least as we will recover from COVID, what pressures are investors facing, do you think, and how are they dealing with it right now? So Natalie, investors are facing incredible pressures. When you think of all the things that Niall was just referencing, you have changing monetary policy, we have geopolitical instability, we have social unrest, we have climate change, we're still navigating the pandemic on a daily basis. And so the question that investors keep asking is, how are we going to continue to generate the needed returns in our portfolios? For the last 10 years, we've had the wind at our backs. We've had accommodated monetary policy. We've had easy borrowing. We've had low inflation, which has really been a tremendous push for stock bond portfolios. But now we have a much more challenging backdrop and we need to generate those same types of returns. And so when you're talking to advisors and they're working with their clients, they're really in this balancing act of how they are going to achieve this. And so now is a real moment when you need a very wide range of tools in your toolkit. And so first it says, do I have the right asset classes? Do I have the range of fixed income? Do I have the inflationary assets? Do I have the alternatives? Do I have the areas for growth in my portfolio? Do I have the right solutions? Because 
investors have become really accustomed to very well-priced solutions. So you need very high quality strategies, well-priced and easy to access. And then it all becomes a question of how do I help my clients understand what the profile and return expectations of my portfolio should be? And so do I have the right tools and portfolio analytics to help run those scenarios and give clients the confidence that their portfolios can withstand the environment that we're in? Mm. Bradley, just to continue kind of setting the scene at the moment in terms of those toolkits and, and, and um, strategies, what developments do you think are critical for wealth managers to keep in mind at the moment? Thank you, Natalie. Well, it, it's, it's interesting in the, in the context of these broader trends, we have yet more on the client side. So their, their values are changing, right? Their goals are changing. It's not just investment performance, right? They want their portfolios to reflect their values. So you know, certainly at the advent of ESG uh, ratings providers, uh, which you know have stepped into that void to try and help, but selection among them and how to apply that filter has to be done carefully to avoid uh, you know uh, fiduciary issues, compliance issues. I would say, in, in addition to that, we've seen you know, direct indexation is certainly in, in the air quite a bit. It's uh, not yet fully realized. We see it in asset management portfolios, but this idea of more value added solutions. So, um, I mean, not just uh, um, index um, funds, but broadly across the overall portfolio, how do we create personalized portfolios at scale? How do we have them more tax efficiently implemented? And of course, at a reasonable price. So those are just some of the things I'd mm -hmm. So you, you touched on sustainability, and I'm sure we'll cover that um, in, in more detail a little bit later on. But it kind of feels like we're at this tipping point of change. The environment you've described, obviously, as you said, Samantha, does sound incredibly challenging. But I suppose when you get to these inflection points of change, there's also opportunity. It sounds trite, but I guess that you know there, there has to be a positives to these headwinds in particular. But it does seem that investors are under massive pressure to move away from the traditional portfolios and look for something more modern. So Samantha, what does that look like in practice and, and how has the 60-40 model changed and what are investors having to do in light of this landscape that you've created for us? So as we've been talking about, the class of protection of a stock bond portfolio is really not what it used to be. And so when you look at fixed income, as Niall was mentioning, the, the diversification that we're used to it providing in terms of the fixed income duration is really on shaky ground today. And so you have the, you know, when you're holding fixed income, as we look at the prospect of higher interest rates, the current dated bonds are less attractive. Over the past number of years, as investors have been seeking yield, they have gone out on the risk curve, which certainly um, may mean those valuations could be challenged. And so when you're looking at this, investors and advisors really need to ask a range of questions. And so I think first, it's really about fixed income, being very clear, what is the role of fixed income in client portfolios? Is it for risk mitigation or is it for income orientation? And then once you've asked that question and you're looking for yield, understanding the suitability of the yield-oriented assets in your asset class and making sure that you're thinking about certain options, whether it be distressed credit, preferred equity, real estate, there are options out there, but the conversations need to be had. And then looking for absolute diversification. So we've been talking about the prospect of inflation and we've all been watching um, what has been happening with respect to inflation. And so having a range of inflation sensitive assets to support a variation of inflation outcomes is critical. And then in terms of kind of modern diversification, certainly the incorporation of alternatives, both around private equity and private debt. And while we need to make sure that we're acknowledging then the increased potential complexity, fees, as well as liquidity questions, the alternatives really do become an important part of client portfolios today. Totally. I mean, I know we've got the whole next session, we'll be looking at uh, private markets in particular, which is great. So there'll be actual time to delve into that. But um, picking up on, on your point about inflation protection, Niall, should we come to you here and, and kind of delve into how investors are actually seeking out inflation protection? What are they doing at the moment? Well, I think the first point is building on the point Samantha just made is you have to ask yourself first, what are you not going to own? So Samantha laid out probably the starting point for fixed income investing is a bit tricky at the moment. Unfortunately, fixed income by its definition doesn't do much by the way of inflation protection. 
So not to load up on bonds negatively here, but it's another strike in the column of what you'd be owning in the, in the context of inflation protection. It's worth remembering that generally speaking, for a, a moderate inflation environment, equities have historically done quite well. Not necessarily starting at these valuation points, but certainly inflation in the order of you know one to two to three to four percent is usually quite a good environment for equities. And so having those in their portfolio is not necessarily a bad idea. But for more explicit inflation protection, you need a direct link. Historically, you'd have used various forms of linkers or tips or other form of inflation-linked bonds. And interestingly, it's worth watching. In most markets, tips or, or sorry, inflation-linked bonds basically just guarantee you inflation minus. They guarantee you a real return, but it's negative. So you'll have your inflation protection, but you'll lose money in real terms on an ongoing basis. Interestingly, particularly the tips market, it's not, not enough people have noticed it, but the 30-year tips has actually just got back to negative, or to a zero real yield. So if that was to continue to go up, that can become more attractive. And if inflation protection is your driver above all else, they remain the assets with the purest link to it. And then though, going beyond that, you want to look at other forms of inflation protection. They can come from a few areas. You're looking for contractually linked cash flows that are linked to inflation. So real estate is a very good place to be. Infrastructure investing is a good place to be. There are various forms in the alternative spectrum that will be interesting um, in that regard. And potentially in the right way, considering all the options, commodities can be an interesting place to be. And protection, particularly if what you're worried is some form of disaster type inflation, then you know, stores of value like gold and others can form a role in your portfolio as something that will protect against that. The other question you have to ask yourself there is to make sure that you get the call and the implementation right. So in other words, are you going to implement via the stocks that produce these things or trying to get a more direct exposure to the underlying factors that you're trying to take advantage of? So Bradley, how do you find wealth managers are, are, are managing that balance of call and implementation? Like how, how are wealth managers delivering a, um, a customized portfolios in the modern structure? It's certainly it's a challenge, right? Uh, when we look at the way portfolios are are often implemented, you see um, a curation, if you will. So perhaps eight different strategies that you could choose from, maybe risk orientation, moderately aggressive, conservative, et cetera, or outcome oriented, like growth and income. And then to make it more complex, different forms of discretion: does the client choose? Does the advisor choose? Or is it run centrally by the CIO office? And then lastly, you see a variety of products and structures, so separately managed accounts for wealthier ETFs, mutual funds for others to implement similar strategies. That said, we are seeing a, a lot of innovation uh, so that will enable the democratization of separate accounts in this asset class diversification, whether it's the alternative platforms that are springing up to make it easier to access product um, at the right bite size, um, and from quality managers, direct indexing, as I mentioned a moment ago, better tax management engines and ESG. So these things all brought together can be used to create personalized portfolios. Um, it, we'll see some uh, firms that truly will step up and will offer you know, unique client by client portfolios. But when you start to think about scaling that to, in some cases, millions of clients, that reduces, introduces tremendous complexity. So others will think, well, maybe I'll have a curated choice again and we'll mix just as we had these traditional you know, style categories alongside ESG uh, blends uh, so that investors can pick not only the portfolio return objectives they want, but also the value objectives that they have. Does this, does this modern approach, do you think it puts a, a greater burden on the wealth manager or a greater burden on internal infrastructures to, to achieve those sorts of portfolios? I, I think it puts an incredible burden. I mean, um, this is all taking place in a broader context where there's been price uh, compression. Advisors are having to do more for less. And many of them in searching to, uh, for areas of creating more value um, alongside what we just said on the investment side are broadening the conversation to cover all things financial. So all these portfolio changes have to happen within uh, a context of, of a broader conversation happening with the client and then making it uh, perhaps more complex with COVID. We've seen changes in the way that clients interact and engage with their advisor uh, remotely, video, online. Our research suggests that there's a permanency to much of this. Many investors you know, prefer online. Certainly some will go back to in-person, some will want a hybrid while others will, will choose full re fully remote engagement. So how do you deliver a, an engaging experience 
uh, with the choose your adventure approach. It, it creates tremendous operational complexity. Totally. And how do you actually, um, sorry not to go off on a tangent too much here, but how do you think wealth managers are actually translating the message of these head headwinds that Niall and Samantha have, have given us an overview of? You know, like, how do you think that clients are actually responding to all of these complexities? You know, do they just think, you know, it's COVID and, and all of my investments are facing tragedy? You know, how do you think they're actually engaging with what's going on? Well, we've done a lot of research on what clients value in an advisory relationship, and it may sound you know, overly trite, but, but uh, someone who can sort of keep them off the ledge, right? Keep them invested through the cycle. Yes, um, as, as Niall said, th these are, it's a, it is a, a sea change, if you will, of, of return environment, um, but this has happened before. It can be managed through, and uh, on average, over time, patients, asset allocation, and then the broader conversation around their wealth management picture. So no longer do many uh, wealth managers rely solely on investment performance uh, to butter their bread. They're having a broader conversation. So maybe we can look at spending uh, different ways of, 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 of borrowing money or the most efficient use of credit. So it's a broader conversation. There are more ways that they can add value to clients and go to keep in the game to help them through uh, what could be a challenging transition. Mm -hmm. Now, I saw you nodding along there. Was there anything you wanted to, to add on, on that point of navigating these, these tricky times? Well, I, I was actually struck by something Bradley said that this has happened before. There, there, there rarely, rarely is anything new under the sun. Um, and there's always a chance, I was actually thinking about it, if we'd been sitting down this time last year, we'd have been talking about a lot of things that had happened in the first six weeks of the year that actually then reverse themselves over the course of the, the later years. So I think the big point is to build portfolios for the long term and rely on diversification because you can never be sure exactly which bit is going to fire when. Um, but if you've built for the long term, you should hopefully be resilient through all of those things. And Natalie, I think that allows me to just bring out the point on, on the scenario analysis that I was talking about. Um, you know, for so long, the, the performance conversation has been one of, as we've been talking about, kind of a stocks, bonds conversation. And so having the ability, whether it's through scenarios or potential outcomes, you know, Niall's been talking about different inflationary environments, it allows you to help explore and kind of set expectations so that when you do have these various market events, your clients aren't surprised and they are coming along with you. And so um, I think that really ends up being such a critical point and as you've had more digitization in terms of the suite that advisors have available to them, they do have more capabilities to be able to deliver um, those kinds of various outcomes and, and help their clients along the way. Do you think it's then just like the, the speed at which we've, we've had to experience so many kind of different headwinds, as you say, that that, that has kind of put the marker in the sand as to why this time in particular is the time for wealth managers to look at their portfolios and their portfolio construction? Or do you just think we need to set ourselves up for the long term, as you say now? I think there's two sides to that. I think speed is a question of what used to take a year, two or three years to play out is now happening in a market a matter of weeks and months. So if you're going to try and be more tactical, you've got to ask yourself, how are you going to do it? And if you haven't got the ability to do it, do you need to find somebody that has to do it for you and has a track record of doing that for you? I think the other thing that is really important in this environment is to try and figure out what your natural advantages are. So when everything is rising quickly, it doesn't, you know, if, if a broad equity portfolio will do it, that's fine. It's probably the case that we have to take advantage of everything now. The portfolio has to be sweated harder now. So what is it that you can afford to take advantage of? Can you be more patient than others? Can you be prepared to lock some of your capital away for a period of the time? Because large parts of the world can't. And so therefore you can get a reward for doing that. So I think one of the big things now is to look at divert, and that's I think what Samantha was getting at with modern diversification. It's not just about asset classes. It's also about the way you access those asset classes and trying to generate every little bit of additional return you can from whatever your natural advantages are. Absolutely. Let's move to touch quickly on China then. Now I'm going to stay with you because as we continue to talk about portfolio opportunities, do you think it's now time for a dedicated China allocation? So 
one of the problems with diversification, which I was hinting at a second ago, is kind of by definition, part of your portfolio will have done better than another part. And if that part of your portfolio tends to be something that less diversified people own, it makes for a very difficult conversation wherever you meet your friends that are holding those less diversified um, portfolios. And when we talk about China or emerging markets in general, that's kind of the starting point of the conversation. Everyone looks at the last 10 years where emerging markets have been a very difficult place to be on a relative basis. If we'd been sitting down in 2011 and we'd been looking back for 10 years, the people who had had a more diversified portfolio would be singing a very different uh, tune at that point in time. So the point is that we think that that diversification, you can never be sure exactly when it's going to fire, but you definitely want to have that. And so EM merits a position in the portfolio. The second thing then, at the risk of making portfolio investing too simple, large parts of it boils down to saying, where is GDP going to go? How can I access that GDP in various ways? And what am I paying for that GDP growth before I start? So if you look at the world through that sort of lens, well, then you're kind of saying, why wouldn't you have an allocation to China inside your portfolio? I think that's the strategic case. I think the structural case as to why you might get, might get more granular around now probably revolves around four things. The index construction is changing. It is going to grow if things are going the way they're supposed to go. So therefore, you can get ahead of that and invest ahead of the passive money that will eventually come. Fundamentally, as I touched on, it's, it's large enough to justify that. The other advantage of a specific allocation is there's huge opportunities for alpha generation or additional return over the benchmark in China. It's one of the universes where we've seen really, really good track records from the best managers. So if you can be a little bit more specific in your allocation, you can take advantage of that in your portfolios. And then I think lastly is the big point about China is going to be there's going to be a lot of different views. There's going to be people who think things have gone too far one way, people who think it's gone too far and are going to go further in another direction. By having an actual specific allocation to it, it allows you to be granular and a little bit more tactical should you want to be in that allocation on an ongoing basis. So Bradley, how do you think wealth managers are actually achieving that? Like, How are they being specific to their allocations and, and what does that translate to, as, to their day to day? Well, it depends on where they're getting their information. So there are some advisors, right, that are building their own portfolios, others that are looking to the home office and others that are using an outsourced CIO or, or strategist. Uh, so I would say it, it, it really depends. Uh, certainly international has been an allocation and the question of whether you within that pick particular regions or countries, that's perhaps less well developed. So uh, at least in the retail construct. So I think what Niall suggests you know, is interesting as they take a look at and, and model um, you know, what that allocation could look like or providing a bit more concentration within their international allocation. So whether they're accessing that through um, you know, ETFs, mutual funds or, or separately managed accounts. Super, let's turn to discuss ESG and how that fits into the asset allocation and portfolio construction process. Niall and Samantha, I'll come back to you on this. Who would like to open on the sustainability section? Okay, I'll jump in. Yeah, thanks. I mean, probably I'll talk about the philosophy and then Sam can probably talk about the actual implementation of it. I mean, I thought I was the only person who used the word trite, but obviously it's, it's one that's used a lot more than I thought. But the, the trite answer on ESG integration is that it has to be everywhere. I'd be clear what I mean here, though. There's a difference between impact investing and sustainability or ESG considerations. Impacting, impact investing is where you've figured out how you want to make a difference and you're prepared to put your capital into that area to make that difference, probably making a return as well, but that's what you're trying to do. Whereas sustainability ESG factors are something that pervade the entire portfolios. They're a, a factor that need to be taken into consideration. So it, it will allow you to identify risks. Are companies going to make poor decisions because they've got poor governance, the G in ESG? Are they going to lose their social license to operate because they've had issues in the supply chains, for example, the S in ESG? And then obviously, are company assets going to lose their value because of movements that go on as part of the overall move towards transition pathways and potential movements towards net zero in the marketplace? So that's the risk side of things. But there's massive investment opportunities that are going to fall out of this as well. Trillions are going to be spent transitioning the global economy and adapting the global economy. 
And that's what investors are looking for when they're looking to try and make a return on capital. From an asset allocation point of view, trying to figure out who wins that transition is going to be a place that we can add value to portfolios. What are going to be the winning asset classes? What are going to be the, the losing asset classes? But also the investors that get the most disparate voices around the table who can identify new pools of talent to give them an edge, they're going to win relative to other investors. And that's a key consideration when we look at the investment managers and ask who are going to generate the best returns going forward. I don't know, Sam, if you want to talk about the more implementation side. So absolutely. So when we talk about then, how do we actually incorporate ESG into portfolios? And you know, when we talk about kind of the transition spectrum, I like it as an analogy because where we are on implementing ESG into portfolios, it really is the gray, the green, the in-between, but we know that we are in the age of engagement. So whether it's sustainability or diversity, equity, inclusion, we need to be able to have these conversations and be effective in implementation. And so first you end up having advisors who, as Niall said, you need to be able to implement on the full spectrum. So whether your clients are impact led or much more financially driven, that is quite a spectrum and you need to be able to address all of those needs. Now on a really good note, with the increased focus on ESG, sustainability, diversity, equity, inclusion, we do have a much broader range of investment options to actually choose from. So, you know, when we think about it, when you start working with clients, there really are a couple steps that are so critical. So the first is really to understand where is your client from a perspective of impact or, and how do they really want to implement? So is this more of an ESG orientation where you might think about it as certain screens or filters, or is this truly more of an impact investment? What is the definition of ESNG? Then you can help your clients understand by what they own. So we have a number of tools that we use, again, back to the analytics, to say, what are the exposures? So if I look at the exposures in my portfolio, where are they from a carbon transition perspective? And do I have a goal of where I want them to get? Or when you think about diversity, equity, inclusion, what is the profile of the managers I have in terms of ownership of their organization, investment decision makers, or just the employees of their firm? And once you have that information, it allows you to then benchmark and have a starting point. And if I could add one example, just to maybe try and get a synthesis of some of these themes together. So think about the last two things we've talked about, or the previous one and this one. We talked about inflation and we've talked about sustainability. So let's think about what might that mean for a portfolio. And let's go back to infrastructure. So one of the things we've talked about is we know why infrastructure assets would have an inflationary link to their cash flows. We know why that would make them a good protection for your portfolio. But we also know that there's going to be a huge move towards um, the transitioning of the economy. And that's going to require a lot of spending on infrastructure. And while historically a lot of infrastructure has maybe been very carbon intensive, this new infrastructure is going to be designed around removing carbon from the economy. So you get a way to create the investment that will give you the investment characteristics that you would like, and is also aligned potentially to goals that you would have around as a portfolio and what you're trying to do as the economy. And it's that trying to link the various themes together that is going to be key going forward. And to do that, you have to see the whole picture, not the specific bits and pieces. Yeah, Bradley, you're nodding along there. Are there any points you want to add to that sort of synthesis? Yeah, no, I, I thought that was a great point. And that's sort of when, when there's a win-win, right? I, I can do right by doing good. Uh, and so the challenge often comes in play with ESG of saying, is there a trade-off between one's values and potential performance? And that's, I think, the stickier wicked and where uh, there, we need better reporting, uh, better disclosure so clients can understand th the trade-offs and be comfortable with that, not just ex ante, but uh, over time. So as, as, as Nile was saying at the cocktail party, when you're talking to your friends, if you've underperformed, but you know it's because of your values, you know, th then you can be right with that. Um, so hopefully that's not the case. You're identifying the opportunities where, uh, again, you, you can express those values in, in winning uh, investment performance. But that challenge does exist. And I think that's where the regulators are also quite keen to make sure uh, that, that ESG doesn't become 
uh, a way of, of compromising performance or allocating funds uh, in, in ways that, that you know, aren't aligned with, with their disclosures and clients' best interests. Great, we're about to turn to um, audience questions now. So if you do have any that you'd like to submit before the end of this session, please do so using the, the tool on the right hand side. Um, but let's, let's take some time, I suppose, to, to wrap up, really. Can you, can you give us an overview of, of where to from here? Like That's quite a big question. But what do you think is on the horizon for wealth management? And where do you think we are in terms of this metamorphosis? Are, 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 are we still in the chrysalis phase? Are we coming out yet? Are we a beautiful butterfly? I hope so. <laughs> um, who, I'd like to address that to, to you all. Niall, do you want to come first? Are you a butterfly? Well, yeah, I, I was. I, we, we discussed in practice questions. You might say I'll give that to Sam. This might be the original question that I give to Sam. And for me, my focus is more on the portfolio side and, and trying to make sure that there's as many options as possible available. The, I think what I know for certain is that as you move along this journey, you're probably going to need more tools in the toolkit than you had before. And so therefore, the questions I would be asking myself is, you know, if you agree with the premise being laid out that you're going to need more diversification, you're going to need to find it in other ways, how are you going to get those building blocks for your portfolio? And then if you are going to then figure out how to piece them together, you know, where are you going to get the support strategically? Where are you going to get the support dynamically? Because these problems are going to be harder than they, they used to be. And, and, and that's the portfolio side. But Sam, you may have some ideas on the on the on the industry side you know i actually think that the industry and wealth advisors are sh should be relatively well positioned for this market you know as bradley mentioned the the wealth industry has been in a major state of transition for a number of years where financial advisors are you know going from investment advisors to life advisors and that transition has been happening for a number of years and some of the themes that we've touched on around access and personalization are perfect for this moment that we're in. Because when we've been talking about, you know, the potential failure of the diversification of a 60-40 portfolio, then the ability to access diversifiers, particularly in alternatives, that's been happening. And so therefore, alternatives are now available to a much broader range of investors than they had been previously. And then when you think about personalization, whether they're the tools in the toolkit of, let's say, direct indexing, that is ideal to then allow you to be able to express certain views with regards to sustainability or diversity, equity, inclusion. And so I do think that we are well positioned to be able to support clients in this environment because of all of the investment that's being made to date. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Thank you all so much for your insight and for your take on the future of wealth management. Thanks to you too for watching. As you know, this is the first of three sessions, so stay tuned to hear more about private markets and sustainable investing. We'd also love to hear your thoughts on this event overall, so please do send us your comments via the feedback button. There's now a short interval before the private market session, during which we'll hear more from Samantha and colleagues on the state of wealth management overall. After this film, please navigate back to the event page and click to watch session two. Thank you again to my panellists and thank you to you for watching. See you again soon. Well, high equity valuations and the low yield environment really means that wealth managers need to consider what asset classes are appropriate to help meet the risk return objectives they're looking to deliver for their clients. Alternatives, particularly private markets, are an area which is being democratised but many private wealth entities don't have the experience to capitalize on this trend. Then there's regulation, which continues to get more stringent and requires additional resources and technology. Many wealth management firms are exploring alternative governance models and strategic relationships, which can help them address these needs without a material increase in their fixed costs. Proposition differentiation is becoming more challenging and the ability to identify and offer unique proposition is really critical. The integration of sustainable investing objectives, for example, is playing an increasingly important role. It really doesn't help either that fees for traditional asset classes have been coming down over the last few years. And data shows that this is likely to continue. That's putting pressure on margins for many wealth managers who need to assure that one, their proposition is of a high standard, and two, differentiated 
and within a competitive fee to both retain the assets they manage and ideally grow their share of wallet. The margin pressure has meant that many are looking at their operating models to improve efficiency and, where appropriate, reduce fixed costs. It's about the organization's value proposition. Wealth managers are challenging themselves to assess which aspects of the value chain they should retain in-house, but they're increasingly recognizing they don't necessarily need to develop all their propositions themselves to provide a compelling investment proposition. Instead, they can build strategic partnerships to seek to gain immediate efficiencies and scale. For example, in the form of manager selection or manager implementation, the question is, what is right for the business? Acquire, sell, or partner? Mercer is a whole-of-market investment specialist, so our approach is to develop and enhance solutions with clients that meet their needs and their customers' needs. We have a well-developed investment infrastructure with $17 trillion under advice and over $400 billion under management through third-party, highly skilled managers. Working with us immediately provides scale and bandwidth to wealth management firms because we can potentially offer reduced fees, access to innovative ideas, sustainable investments integration and efficiencies, for example. A research team of over 200 people on the long-only side and 150 on alternative specialists allow wealth managers to find new and highly skilled managers in a timely manner. And what's more, they can be sure that those managers are of a high caliber. With over 150 investment specialists and alternatives, which includes both hedge funds and private markets, and a 30-year history, we have great expertise in sourcing and accessing highly rated managers. We already work with several wealth managers to develop and deliver private market solutions for their clients, either on their or our infrastructure. We work with a lot of wealth managers as an extension of their investment teams and support them with risk management, manager identification, and investment due diligence, and ultimately their investment proposition for their clients. In other words, our flexible operating model is tailored to amplify our clients' expertise. There are four primary issues that wealth managers are wrestling with on behalf of their clients. One, they need to adjust to the fundamental shifts in the global investment landscape, which are being driven by a number of factors, including the future of global fiscal and monetary policy and its impact on markets, and the role of the Asian century and how to play it through a mix of onshore versus offshore strategies. The second issue consists of addressing the looming breakdown in traditional correlations between asset classes. The classic protection of the 60-40 portfolio will likely no longer be sufficient. That's why many wealth advisors are focusing on private market opportunities, yet they lack the infrastructure and resources to execute. After all, private markets add investment complexity and cost to investor portfolios, and it requires specialized research expertise. Protecting client portfolios from inflation represents another challenge. How can wealth advisors efficiently hedge against inflation, and how do client time horizons influence this positioning? And finally, it's not just inflation clients have to worry about, but also the effects of climate risks. Wealth managers need to find a way to protect their client portfolios while also having to find the best ways to capture these opportunities. As Amit mentioned, our goal is to be an extension of the team for Wealth Advisors to help provide additional expertise, efficiency, and differentiation. We engage with Wealth Advisors to broaden their investment toolkits through manager access, traditional asset solutions, hedge funds and private assets, as well as customized programs. These investments are all supported by robust risk management analytics for the teams and their clients.